So are there any quick questions that have come up that you would like an, an opinion on? Uh -huh. I wonder how are they supposed to fit? Um, I usually leave my mittens a little bit bulky because I, I frequently I keep my glove liners on underneath them. Uh, because if I'm traveling, if I need to do something and can't do it with a mitten on, I pull the mitten off and I have the glove liner on underneath. So I usually have a layer on underneath. Um, it kind of depends on, you know, I have two different mitten systems. Uh, I have uh, my big, huge, bulky 8,000 meter mittens that I bring in to do the knot tying test for this class and everybody gets to try them. <laughs> Just a little warning. Um, and then I have uh, two different mitten. I have a lined pair of mitten shells and an unlined pair of mitten shells. And I have down mittens that I can put into either of those shells. Sometimes I just wear the shells with my uh, glove liners underneath. So I like things a little bit loose. And the big thing is if you can cinch them down at the wrist so that they aren't sliding off. Mm -hmm. The other big thing in any kind of glove or mitten system, idiot strings. Something that attaches it to you. Uh, because on, if you put something down on a glacier, it will disappear. Mm -hmm. um, in this class, for our purposes, you might get it back, unless <laughs> I really like it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, big winds come up when there's gear left out on any of our <laughs> field sessions. It's amazing what happens. Uh, but out in the real world, I've, see, I've waved goodbye to a $150 jacket that was sailing off towards the Pacific Ocean down a glacier. Um, it's really fun when you do stupid things like that. I only did that once. I'm not that wealthy. Uh, so definitely idiot strings and something that you can adjust at the wrist. Another bonus thing, one of my pair of mittens has a little piece of fleece sewn in right here which makes an excellent nose wipe. So those are good things to think about. Any other questions that have come up gear-wise? OK, the other question I've gotten a couple of times is, hey, this cool book that you gave us, well, are we supposed to be reading that? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yes. So your goal should be to read the book before the field sessions start. We will not specifically reference the book here, uh, but we will need the book uh, before the field sessions start. Um, so that's something that uh, you want to do. It'll help you with setups. Um, you'll hear some differing opinions. Uh, most of the stuff in the book I really like, and I do. There's a couple of things that some of us choose to do slightly different from the book. Um, and again, as Mike emphasized in his class, the big question to ask is why? If you see me doing something and the book said something else, why did the book do it that way? Why am I choosing to do it a different way? And which one of those reasons makes sense to you? Um, that's the kind of stuff you should be asking yourself as we go through this. Okay? All right. With that, um, I will turn you over to Denise. Uh, for those who haven't met her before, Denise Snow, longtime trip leader and member of the CMC, um, and possibly the most fit person I know. Uh, so she always comes in and does the fitness lecture um, because she really takes a very scientific approach to keeping herself in really top shape. Uh, so we're really lucky to have her here, and um, we'll hand you over to Denise. Well. First, I have to apologize because I am very passionate about fitness. So um, you're going to hear a lot of stuff tonight. I'd like to tell you a lot more. We're limited by the time um, that I have. Um, but there are tons of, of resources out there. If you really want to get into this, I've listed a few books right here on the table um, that I use as references and that are also very good for um, looking at ways of doing various training programs. Um, but tonight I'm going to give you some idea of what kind of training program you can put together, how to put it together, et cetera. Um, first of all, you guys are going to be climbing big mountains. 
to do that takes a lot of planning, preparation, and a fairly good amount of physical fitness, aerobic fitness. Um, in order to be able to climb safely and quickly, you need to have a fair, a fair amount of strength and a fair amount of, of good, strong um, capability to be able to do that quickly um, and safely. A very elite example of that um, is a climber currently um, from Spain who is um, doing uh, essentially ultra runs, ultra marathons. And his name is Killian, um, Killian Jornet Brigada. And uh, he's a very interesting person because right now he's probably considered to be the best trail runner in the world. And he's won six times a um, series called Skyrunner World Series, um, where this World Series includes a lot of the very elite uh, marathons. One of them would be the Ultra Trail Tour de Mont Blanc. Uh, another one is the uh, Western States Endurance Run. Another one right here in Colorado, which you might be familiar with, is the Hard Rock 100. Um, so he's, he's very, very good at what he does, but he does this mainly to train for his mountain climbing. And he currently holds speed ascents on the Matterhorn, the Mont Blanc, and Denali. To give you an idea of some of these speed ascent accomplishments, he did the Mont Blanc from Chamonix in four hours and 57 minutes round trip with an, with an ascent time of three hours and 33 minutes covering a vertical distance of 12,654 feet. His average ascent speed was 3,300 feet per hour. His record was slowed because he had to stop to help his partner who had fallen in a 20 foot crevasse um, before he could continue. The Matterhorn. He did it from the Italian side, did it on the Lion Ridge, um, which is a, a 5-3 grade um, if you use the fixed ropes. He did that in 2 hours and 52 minutes round trip with an ascent time of 1 hour and 56 minutes covering 8,100 feet of ascent. And then Denali from Calhetna Base Camp at 7,200 feet. He did it in 11 hours and 48 minutes round trip with an ascent time of 9 hours and 45 minutes covering 13,037 feet of ascent. He raced up and down the west, but west buttress route with the rescue gully variation. And he used skis and crampons for the ascent and skied almost all the way down. Now, this is, this is an example of an elite athlete. You're probably not going to go out and try to compete at that level. You're probably, a lot of you may not even want to compete at all. But one of the things you have to think of is that you are going to be competing with yourself in order to make it to the top of a lot of these big peaks. And so because of this, you really need to start thinking of yourself as an athlete. And you need to start training as an athlete. Oh. Before I continue, this, this slide was taken on Urizaba. I took it. So you need to start thinking of yourself as an athlete. Um, a lot of times in the past, uh, climbers have used the old adage, I, the, only, the only, only way I need to train is just climb. Well, that strategy might work very well for 20-somethings, and it might work very well for a few of us that might be gifted enough to be in an elite category. But for the most part, that type of approach to training usually ends up just having performance plateaus or having recurrent injuries. So what I'd like to focus on tonight is time efficient and better ways of organizing your training so that you can accomplish the goals that you want to, want to accomplish. Also, these types of training methods are being put out there um, by various um, scientific um, 
organizations and trainers, personal trainers and, and physiology um, type um, uh, training that uh, th this is nothing that uh, is magic. It's a lot of, lot of research has gone into these methods and trying to make sure that, that they're you know, effective in being able to make you a, a better athlete. Also, this is something that will benefit people who are really fit already or people that are currently out of shape. Um, people that are in their you know, teens and all the way up into people that are octogenarians. Um, so that's what I would like to focus on tonight. And one of the things that really excites me about training, not just because I'm a competitor, but also for my lifestyle. I love the outdoors. I love climbing. I like backpacking. I love skiing. You name it. I love to be outdoors. And if you continue to be, you know, working on your fitness level, then decades from now, you'll still be able to enjoy all of these activities, um, you know, continuously. So uh, the idea behind what I want to talk about tonight is not only to get you ready for what you're wanting to do in terms of climbing now, but have something that you can use for the rest of your life to continue enjoying what you enjoy doing. So are you limited by age? Well, this person here, I had the very um, big privilege of meeting when he was 98, Ulrich Indervinen. And he's, he was the world's oldest mountain guide. In fact, when I was in Switzerland um, at one time, while he was 86, um, he was still guiding. And he was interviewed um, in, the, in the paper in, in Zurich. And he, uh, in, in his interview, had talked about one of the times he had a client who complained that he was going too fast at 86. And he said, well, I guess you're just going to have to find another older guide. And, uh, and he continued to guide until he was 98. Um, so he died at the age of 103. And I just want to read a little excerpt about him. The Matterhorn was a hugely important place in Ulrich Indebinen's life. He was born in 1900 in Zermatt at the mountain's foot, a remote village of only 750 people, with tourism a small but burgeoning industry. Ulrich rarely left the region of his birth and was 20 before he took the train to the nearest town. To make up for it, he climbed out of the valley quite often, almost daily for nearly 70 years. He scaled all 14,700 feet of the Matterhorn more than 370 times, though he is said to have lost track of the exact number. Ulrich thought the Matterhorn the most beautiful mountain in the world. Although it was only one of many mountains he climbed over the course of the 20th century, guiding innumerable clients up and down with an exhaustible good cheer, no other so engrossed him. On his first ascent at the age of 20, he went with his sister Martha and a friend of hers. The girls wore long skirts and their ordinary shoes, and the lanterns they were carrying kept blowing out. Since none of them knew the route, they followed scratch marks made by previous climbers on the rocks. On his last ascent, bent double under his ropes at the age of almost 90, he conquered the mountain in four hours. He gave up mountain guiding at, oh, at 97, not 98, when he realized he had taken 10 minutes longer than he should have done to descend the Brighthorn. Ulrich met life with the same equanimity as the mountains, his dry wit punctuating his monumental en energy. When asked if he ever got bored climbing the same peaks again and again, he replied, only when the clients walk too slowly. When one journalist pointed out that, that an enthusiastic review from an American client in the 1930s, Ulrich replied, perhaps he did not know any other guides. He built his house with his own hands, finishing it in 1935, and lived in it for the rest of his life. He knew what he wanted and had it close by. Especially, he wanted those particular mountains. George Mallory, a British mountaineer who tried to conquer Everest and died on it, famously said he wanted to climb the peak because it was there. Mallory crystallized a romantic vision of the mountaineer chasing after dreams on ice wrap summits far from home and hearth. Ulrich Indebinen could not have been more different. He went up mountains, 
Not because they were there, but because he was. He died gently in his bed, and although he may not have been the first to climb the Matterhorn, he seems to have climbed it best. So on that note, I just wanted to give um, this diagram, which shows uh, two graphs, one of all the marathon world records and one of the Ironman Triathlon World Championship records. You see on the vertical scale, you've got time and hours, and then you've got age groups here. What I wanted to show on this graph was that, in general, you can see that as people get older, the records, the times, are a little bit slower. And if you look at this column on both of these graphs, these are both the, the 50 um, to 59 age groups, you see that you start to see a little bit more trending slower at that time. Here, it's kind of a gradual trend, and then it starts to climb a little bit more steeply. And then as you start getting out into the 70 age groups, you see it going a little bit steeper yet. However, if you look, let's look at the marathon world records for 80 to 84. The, the women are still sub five hours in a marathon. The men are still sub four hours in a marathon. That's pretty damn good. There's probably a lot of you in here that couldn't do that now. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out with this graph is that what they're finding is, is that the baby boomer age group um, is just now starting to peak um, at their mid-60s to latter 60s, okay? So that the latter part of the baby boom generation is just starting to get into that age group. And in the 1970s, um, that's when the real big, um, most of you probably weren't even around then, but in the 1970s, that's when the, tr uh, essentially the big fitness and running um, generation started going. And the baby boomers at that time were, their, were in their late 20s. What we're seeing now in a lot of these records here is that you're seeing the latter part of the, the baby boomer generation starting to break some of these, these records. Um, beforehand, you had the, what they call the silent generation. And that, that generation was, it was between, were born between like 1929 and 1945. The silent generation, um, they, were, they essentially grew up during the Great Depression, um, the World War II, and the Cold War. And at that time, recreation, physical fitness, was not a, an option. I mean, they were, they were worried about just making ends meet, their you know, families, their careers. And so nobody really got into physical fitness. But what they're projecting now is, is that the, as the baby boomers start getting into the 70s and 80s, that they'll start bringing, breaking records in that age group as well. So it, just to give you an idea of, you know, if you start using physical fitness, not just to get ready for climbing, but as a lifestyle, you might be able to do a lot of things well into your older age um, as a result. Did I go too far? Yeah, okay. Okay, so your body is an amazing machine, actually. Um, if you stress your body and then allow it to recover, your body can essentially go, hey, that hurt. I better do something so that the next time you do that to me, it doesn't hurt. And so you stress, you recover, and your body essentially builds stronger to as actually, you know, take on that stress that you gave it so that the next time that stress isn't a stress anymore. But likewise, your body does the opposite. If you don't stress it, yeah, I don't need that anymore. And you lose it. So it, training is a very easy concept. Overall, you stress and then you recover. What you really don't want to do is not use it. Because for one, you are losing it faster than you gain it. 
And for endurance athletes, which is what mountain climbers are, you can lose it as much as two to three times faster than you gain it in periods of total inactivity. So the idea here is keep moving, keep doing it, um, because it's so much harder to gain it back once you lose it. And there's a world of difference between training harder and training smarter, because what we want to do is maximize our time to get the most out of it and not spend lots of time out there just thinking that I'm getting a really good workout when I'm not. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are pressed for time just like I am and, and want to maximize um, our efficiency. So that's what we'll talk more about. You're also here today because you have a goal. Um, probably because you want to climb a peak or, or peaks or just learn to become a better climber. And in order to achieve your goal, needs a lot of motivation, a lot of times. I mean, you, you know, there, there's going to be many times in your life when you've got a busy schedule, a busy, lots of things going on, the weather sucks, where you're just like, I don't really want to get out there. And, and you really got to, you really have to think in terms of what is it going to take to motivate me to get out there when I least want to. And so that's something that uh, is really important when we're talking about um, trying to do a fitness program. Um, I'm going to read a little excerpt um, from uh, an Olympian cross-country skier on goals and motivations. Something strange happened to me this August. In the spring, I had set the ambitious goal of running a 1450 or better for five kilometers. On August 14th, I ran this exact time, a two second PR, and the fastest ever five kilometer by a 31 year old New Hampshire resident on New Hampshire soil. Yes, someone actually keeps records of the statistics. This was actually the first time since college that I had achieved my season's big goal in such a clear cut way. Even when I went to the Olympics, which is admittedly a slightly bigger deal than setting a single age state record, my bigger goals, top 20 in an individual race, a good leg in the relay, turned out to be far beyond my grasp. And so when I woke up on August 15th, I found myself in an unfamiliar situation. I was not in the by now seemingly normal position of trying to figure out what went wrong or how I could fix it or of ignoring this conundrum and just going out hard and long till I got, either got better or I got hurt. I could simply go out, train a bit, and enjoy the feeling of success. This good feeling, though, lasted about three days. Then for a few days, I was actually adrift, unsure of my motivation, having to convince myself to get out the door and train. And then I discovered that I wanted more. I started wondering if I had set an ambitious enough goal this year, how I could improve next year, what training would be necessary to top this past summer, and what other races I should jump into. I also wondered what kind of ski season I should expect after such a well-executed running season. What kind of placement should I aim for in the Eastern Super Tour races? And then the good feeling returned. I felt motivated to rush out the door each morning. It turns out that reveling in success is no better than wallowing in defeat. In either case, the obsession with the past saps the joy of training in the present. But as I imagine solid races this winter in Stowe and Anchorage and Craftsbury, I visualize bigger successes in next summer's running races. I felt the familiar pleasure of the central struggle in athletics to be better, not than, not than anyone else, but than myself. This then is why we set goals, and not just any goals, but goals that might seem unachievable. It is partly for the brief euphoria of getting to the date circled on the calendar and achieving the time or the placement we have written down in the training log, the locker, or the diary. But mostly it's because being fit and fast and becoming fitter and faster is a great reward unto itself. And the goals we set for ourselves are what make our training sessions into optimistic, joyful times. <clears throat> 
And I really like this quote. I mean, there's no shortcut to success. If you don't care enough about the goal to do the work to achieve it, you should find a goal that you're more passionate about. So it's really important that the training just doesn't become drudgery. Um, that you have, you have goals, you have motivations that make you passionate. I mean, not every single day. That's not going to happen. But at least something that really makes you passionate about going out. And, you know, it can be anything from, you know, you could, you could put something on your calendar that just says, I want to accomplish this on such and such a date that you can have some motivation that says, if I don't go, you know, start getting out and doing this every day, I'm not going to be able to make what I put on that calendar. So to achieve your goal, you need a plan. And uh, what we're going to do tonight is give you some ideas of how to put together a fitness plan. One of the first things that you do when you think of putting together a plan is very similar to what you would do in a retirement plan. In a retirement plan, you say, hmm, I'd like to be able to retire, let's say, by when I'm 65, okay? And then you, you would say, and I want to be able to make this much money when I retire. So then you would back up on the calendar and start looking at what you're going to have to do financially in order to reach that goal at your age 65. A training plan is very similar. You have some goal on your calendar. I want to climb Denali in such and such a date. In order to climb Denali, I've got to be able to carry this much weight. I've got to be able to haul this much weight in a sled. I have to be able to make it you know, this many miles per day and this much elevation gain per day, et cetera, et cetera. And then you back up on your calendar and start building your training program in order to reach that goal. And so we're gonna, that's what we're going to focus on tonight to give you some idea of how to do that. You're also going to do that when you back up the calendar, breaking it up into segments, weekly, daily, monthly. The reason you do that is for one, you have to, in order for you to build up to a certain goal, you have to have you know, some succession of how you do that. Financially, you're not going to make a whole bunch of money all at once. You've got to put aside a little bit of money here, and then as it builds up, then you can diversify here and there, et cetera. The same with training. If you went out and you wanted to be able to walk barefoot across the gravel, and you, you know, every day you did a little bit at a time until you built up calluses, eventually you could go out and walk across. But if you just walked out the first day, all you'd end up with is cuts and bruises. So you have to have some type of progressive building in order to um, eventually get to your goal. Fitness training for mountaineering essentially is, is a function of three parts. Aerobic fitness, and that's essentially training your body to breathe efficiently. And that's the bulk of mountain climbing because you're usually at high altitudes where there's not very much air, so you need to really work at, at aerobic fitness. Strength, um, not only to carry loads, but to help make you more efficient overall. Um, a lot of people don't realize how important, for example, core strength is um, for any sport because your core is essentially the foundation for your legs. <coughs> for your whole, your whole mode, you know, way of moving. Um, so if you have a weak core, I don't care how strong your legs are, eventually you're, you're not going to reach your goals because you're, you're going to break down essentially from not having a strong enough foundation. And then the third thing um, that's very, very important, when I talked about training being stress and then recovery, if you're always having the stress part but never having the recovery part, you're never getting stronger. The, the, the fitness doesn't come from when you're actually stressing. The fitness comes from the recovery part when your body has a chance to rebuild and come back stronger. 
And then another one that's really hard for most of us that love to be active is when you do get an injury, to let it rest and heal. Most of us want to try to get back out way too soon and, and never end up letting it um, recover. So what is aerobic um, training? Um, essentially, aerobic training is training where you're going to do something that gets your heart beating at least at half throttle to full throttle. And it, for an extended period of time. There's a lot of long-term health benefits to doing this, not just for physical fitness for your sport, but it also helps get rid of unnecessary body fat, helps decrease the risk of heart attack, stroke, diabetes, um, helps with your stress levels, helps with your sleep in a lot of cases, and also improved energy levels. Um, a lot of people think that um, especially people that don't do any kind of sports or activities, that this is just going to make you more tired, not less tired. But what you find out is that the, is the more you exercise and the fitter that you become, the more energy you have, because in general your body is in a lot better shape and you're able to do even everyday activities a lot more than the average person that doesn't do any type of physical fitness. And I think that's a great benefit. So I'm going to give a little bit of some ideas about what's happening in your aerobic system when you start to exercise. When you first start any type of vigorous activity, um, the, first, the first way that your body gets energy is to tap into two different sources. One is glucose, which is a sugar that's in your blood. And the other is glycogen, which is also a form of sugar, which is in your muscles. And the very first, let's say I'm just going to start off running right at this point. Right at that very first moment, in order for my body to get energy, the first thing it's going to do is use a, what we call an anaerobic source, no oxygen that's, that's using in the process, <clears throat> where it actually burns and the, glu the, the glucose and the glycogen to make energy so that you can sustain that run. Um, because it's anaerobic, the um, byproducts of this burning of this sugar, so to speak, the byproducts are going to be um, in the form of a lactic acid. And we'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more detail in a minute. But what happens with lactic acid is it's, it becomes debilitating to your muscles, okay? And eventually your muscles um, will get to the point to where they can no longer, you know, generate the energy for you to run. But if you are going at a pace that's slow enough at, after a couple of minutes, then your aerobic system kicks in to generate energy. And the aerobic system since it has oxygen present, it utilizes the, the same sugars that were in your muscles, the glycogen, but also um, sugars that are in your liver, which are also a glycogen type um, sugar. And in the presence of oxygen, it's able to use um, this to, to create energy um, with only the, only the byproducts of, of carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And in that, no, carbon dioxide and water. And in that case, you don't get the debilitating effects of this lactic acid on your, on your muscles. Now, the anaerobic system is still there waiting to kick in if for some reason all of a sudden you need to make this sprint up the hill or some sudden surge of, of energy. It's waiting to kick back in. But because you have lactic acid as a byproduct of, of this process, that can really only help you for like a couple of minutes before you're left with that feeling where your, your muscles are burning in your legs, you're you know, bent over gasping, that type of thing. Um, so it's really only something that you can tap into for short periods of time. 
Now, after about 30 minutes of exercise, if you're sustaining your exercise at a low enough level, um, another system kicks in where you burn fat. And that's what you make energy out of, is your fat. And this essentially can continue almost indefinitely because you know, no matter how lean you are, you've got you know, infinite amounts of fat you know, that you can use to tap into. And you still have to have some glycogen that's being used in order to, to, to uh, catalyze this process, so to speak. Um, but you can continue on burning fat for, for long periods of time. And so this is, this is something that, um, the reason I'm bringing all this up is because we're gonna talk about different forms of exercise where you're utilizing different types of energy um, sources. Okay. So there's essentially adaptations that your body makes um, in response to any type of effective training program. One is increased aerobic capacity, um, also called commonly VO2 max. Um, this is an adaptation that your body does um, in order to um, deal with stress where you're really you know, cranking hard and, and trying to really you know, cause a lot of breathing, um, it can actually compensate by trying to increase the amount of oxygen that you can process. So a VO2 max is just essentially how much oxygen can you process per kilogram of body weight, so it's, it's measured in milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per, per minute, okay? The maximum volume um, in a sedentary 40-year-old man is usually about 40, VO2 max of 40. An average highly trained athlete is about 70. The highest recorded, um, an 18-year-old Norwegian cyclist was 97.5, and Matt Carpenter, who a lot of you might be familiar with, um, that name was 92, or is 90, or probably was 92 at this point. Um, and the highest recorded woman is 83, a Swedish uh, cross-country skier. So um, by being able to take in more oxygen per minute, obviously has a benefit because that's how you're going to produce energy. Um, so the more, more oxygen you take in, the more energy you produce, the faster you go. Unfortunately, um, VO2 max to some extent is largely hereditary. Um, you, you're born with it or you're not. Um, but if you're currently unfit, you can improve your VO2 max with a good, with an effective training program by as much as 50%. Which is, which is a huge improvement. So, and then another aerobic adaptation that takes place um, is called um, the uh, lactate threshold, an increased lactate threshold. And the lactate threshold is just a way of, of measuring how you transition or when you transition from your aerobic to the anaerobic um, state. Um, so the, the more you can push off that transition period from going anaerobic, um, the better off that you're going to be. And if you're out of shape, um, this transition place may take place around 50% of your VO2 max. But with an effective training program, you can push it up to 80% or higher of your VO2 max. So that means you can go that much harder, that much faster before you start getting into that anaerobic zone. Other um, adaptations to a effective training program, your heart enlarges because you're building stronger muscle. So you're actually getting thicker muscle larger muscle volume to take in more blood to push it through. Um, your heart pumps more blood um, as a result. Your heart rate recovers faster. That's a good thing so that you can have those surges up the hill and then you know, have a little bit of a recovery and then your heart rate comes down and, and you're able to go on again. 
um, your resting heart rate can decrease. So um, most people, um, when they start a really effective training program, will start to see um, as much as one heartbeat per week lowering in your resting heart rate. Elite athletes um, commonly have uh, resting heart rates in their low 30s. Um, an average unfit person is usually somewhere between 60 and 80. Um, and then athletes, uh, fairly trained athletes, are usually somewhere between 40 and 60. Um, but that's something that you can start to see um, as you start a good training program. Um, your blood plasma uh, volume and your red blood cells um, increase because you need to get more oxygen to your muscles quicker, and so that's another adaptation that takes place. You build more capillaries. Um, so you have a lot more capillaries going out through the muscles. Um, one of the things that can be a side benefit to this is that because you've got more capillaries bringing blood down through your you know, extremities, you can have less problems with cold hands and feet because you're getting more circulation, more energy going to the, all of those tissues as well. Another really side benefit of that is what my doctor says is one of the best things you can do to prevent heart attacks. Um, by building those extra capillaries, they're also building into your heart. So if you have any blockages in any of those blood vessels in your heart, you've got multitude other ones to get oxygen to your heart to keep it from suffering from um, oxygen lack and dying. Um, so all these are great things for, for your health. Um, you build more mitochondria. Mitochondria are the cells that actually produce all that energy for you. So it takes all of those sugars and, and, and processes that to, to give you energy. Um, your, if your muscles are better trained, you can store more uh, glycogen for energy and you can store more triglycerides, which are a, a form of fat um, that you can use to quickly burn and, and get more energy. You also can start utilizing fat better. So you can actually train your body over a long period of time through you know, extended periods of exercise to burn fat as a fuel, um, which is a great concept um, if you're not wanting to, to be overweight. Um, and also your tendon and ligament repair is enhanced um, because your tendons and ligaments tend to have a very low blood supply in general. And so when they get injured, um, a lot of times it takes them a long time to, to heal, whereas they've shown that through moderate to uh, low to moderate e uh, exercise uh, programs that you can actually enhance recovery of your uh, tendons and ligaments. I have a quick question. Yeah. How do you measure the resting heart rate? The resting heart rate, um, the, the best way to measure it um, is, is in the middle of the night. Your lowest heart rate is usually right in the middle of the night. And so if you want to if you want to accurately measure it, it's best to wear a heart rate monitor. Um, and uh, a lot of times, you know, you don't want to get up in the middle of the night, but it, let's say it's first thing in the morning. Um, if you have the heart rate monitor on, what you do is essentially don't get up. You just lay there, um, look at your heart rate, um, and then just take it before you even get up and move around out of bed.